the central police station headquarters. That was a place that was not fit to keep human beings away, animals, let alone human beings. And the place was so dark, so stingy, and so ill ventilated that you cannot stand inside for more than 24 hours. But I was brought in there for 24 hours a day. And the whole place was infested with bugs. I had a lot of bugs for company. There was no reading material. The lights were so dim that I could hardly see the crease on my hand. So immediately the five of us were there, went on hunger strike. And my ulcer bled and I had to be transferred to the hospital. That was the so-called habeas corpus right that you had. You tried it at your own risk of being severely punished. The second time I went to the habeas corpus case is when they tried to forced me to do manual labor. That was in 1972. They said all the teenagers should do manual labor as a uh, program of rehabilitation. I was supposed to do carpentry. So this, this uh, security gentleman told me, it's good for you as a doctor, you try to become more dexterous with your hands. <laughs> so I said, you do not have the qualification to enter a medical college. And here you're trying to tell a doctor what is good for postgraduate education. But you're overreaching yourself. So he said, this is a lot. You have to you pay you eight cents a day. So we all went on hunger strike. And some of us went on hunger strike for three months in order to frustrate the attempt to make us liberals like criminals. I went on hunger strike for three weeks before they came and said, OK, we examine you from there. The women detainees in the New Crescent Center went on a strike for 130 days. And uh, they were forced fed. Some of them vomited after being fed by the, the, the milk by the tube and slipped forcibly into their esophagus. And one girl vomited, and uh, the, the superintendent forced four waters to carry her and wipe the floor with her pants. This is the kind of treatment method to detainees. All this, of course, suppressed in the press. But there's a thing that we all had to go through. You know, all of us had to go through this detention in solitary confinement. Now, solitary confinement, according to Lee Kuan himself, is a very bad form of torture. I'll read to you what Lee Kuan said about solitary confinement. The biggest punishment a man can receive is total isolation. In a dungeon, black and complete withdrawal of all stimuli. That is real torture. Lee Kuan Yew, January 2008. Although he knows that it's real torture, he has no compunction in meeting out this real torture to all detainees without exception. Some of us had to undergo this real torture, not for two days, three days, but for six months. Now, under the law, there is a protection for even criminal prisoners from this kind of torture. A prisoner, a criminal prisoner, when found guilty of infringing prison rules, will be sentenced to sort of provider for not more than two weeks because of the obvious mental ill health effects. But for political detainees, there is no protection. The Lee Mao's Lee Yu Sing, the director general, the, 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 the general manager of Nanyang Sampao, was put into solitary confinement not once but twice. And it was to his credit, he stood that kind of real torture. Titi Raja, a lawyer, who was detained for two and a half years, was put under solitary confinement for six months, twice. Said Jahari was put under solitary confinement four times in his long 17 years of detention. Uh, it is to our credit that we did not take down in spite of this real protest. We stood our ground and held on to our integrity. Today, we are asking us to be magnanimous. What does magnanimity mean? Only those who have suffered has the moral right, moral standing to be magnanimous, not the culprit. The culprit can seek forgiveness if they admit their mistakes and uh, apologize for it. Not for the 
not for the victims of this torture to seek for forgiveness. We are the one who has to be magnanimous. And we are prepared to be magnanimous, provided the culprits admit their mistakes and seek our forgiveness. In my statement that I released to the press in 1932, through my wife, Dr. Christian, and which was, of course, suppressed by the newspapers, but was distributed a lot to, to all student organizations. I said the proper way to settle our case is that uh, you must release us without conditions, unconditional un release. And moreover, you must compensate us for a long detention and also apologize. I say I'm prepared to forgo these two last conditions of having to compensate us and also having to apologize to us. Because I don't believe an arrogant man like this one will sponsor that thing. But the question of release unconditionally, that will stand firm. I stood firm and have to suffer for two decades. That is the price that we pay for our integrity. In Singapore, we have a situation where the government leaders said they have integrity that has to be sustained by the highest pay in the world. And then they demand from political opponents and detainees an integrity that has to sustain the longest imprisonment in the world. This kind of two types of integrity to compare them is to compare heaven and earth. Why should anybody has to sacrifice so much just to sustain his integrity and his beliefs? And government can have to reward themselves with so much high pay. This is the immorality of the political situation in Singapore today. Now, detention without trial is not a peaceful action. It's an act of violence. We come to see you not in the day night with the education time. We come in the morning, 4 a.m. is the usual time. That's the time when decent people sleep and the political terrorists and tyrants strike. And when you're detained, you're subjected to all kinds of mental and even physical torture. This is not only unique for the 1963 batch, it was also practiced in many other batches of detention, 1972, and as late as 1987. So, Run and her group of so-called Marxist detainees were subjected to physical and mental and physical torture. 